It's Denny Hamlin's world, and we're just living in it. I'm Dan McFadden, host of Dropping the Hammer with Dan McFadden, presented by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. And we are back here this week to talk about Denny Hamlin's win in last Saturday night's Bristol night race. And with me to talk about it, as always, is my co-host, Jared Haas. So yes, Jared, Denny Hamlin, the winner of the, of the Bristol night race, his third such win in Thunder Valley. All of them have been in the night race. Um, and he kind of ran away with this one, um, which is surprising given he had a speeding penalty uh, early on this race. But Denny Hamlin uh, sends the first round of the playoffs off with a win. What did you think of Mr. Hamlin's third win of the season? Well, let's start it right here. Denny Hamlin beat your favorite driver this weekend in the Cup Series. All of them. All of them. Um, and it's the confidence of Denny Hamlin, which we've seen, you know, I think spits and spatters of it. I, I think back like to 2010 would be a prime example. But this is like Denny Hamlin obviously taking it to a whole different level and performing this time, even though the mistakes were made, as you mentioned, a speeding penalty. And this is the time for Hamlin to get, quote, white hot during the season. Um, so ended the round of 16 with a win, got some more, like I said, playoff points, and made a statement that, you're going to go through the championship. You got to go through that 11 team. No, it, it is his moment. Uh, leaving the first round of the, the playoffs, Mr. Hamlin, driver of the number 11 uh, Toyota for Joe Gibbs Racing, uh, he led 382 laps in the first round. Uh, but this was his only win of the round. Uh, so he, you know, he famously had a tire, loose wheel at Darlington that relegated him to a 25th place finish. And then last weekend at Kansas, he just chose wrong on the, the last pit stop at Kansas Motor Speedway. Kansas Speedway. Um, he, he's, he's having a moment. Uh, he says this, he said this year feels different. Um, with this win on Saturday night, Hamlin is now the winningest NASCAR Cup Series driver in NASCAR history to not win a championship with his 51st uh, career win. He's surpassed Junior Johnson. Uh, he's actually held this distinction for a while uh, when it comes just simply to the modern era. Uh, he, he passed uh, Mark Martin years years ago um, because Martin had 40 wins and w without a cup title. So now it is Hamlin alone on the Mount Everest of winning his cup drivers without um, a title. How 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 just how dangerous would you estimate that Denny Hamlin that that 11 team is now going into this round of two, which has Texas Motor Speedway, uh, Talladega, which He's always a threat when it comes to super speedways. And then, you know, that big, big, the, the, the Talladega itself is a, a wild card. But then you have the Roval uh, there. How I just do not want to be in the wrong side of the sword fight against <laughs> Denny Hamlin right now. Um, <laughs> confidence is an all time high, even with, like I said, the mistakes that happen there. Hamlin is hitting his stride at the right time. And again, it does feel different. Uh, considering the back this season, he's already had, um, he's already improved his top fives from last season. Mm -hmm. um, 10 top fives last season, already 11 this season. Um, and Hamlin just missed the championship four last season. Remember, he was only a couple points out. If Ross Chastain didn't yeah. hail mail on it into the Martinsville turn three and four area, Hamlin would be in contention for the championship last season. And I, I think that really sparked a fire, and Hamlin's just putting it forward to say, hey, you know what, I'm, it may have been a blip with 2020, you know, 2020 season was his all-time, you know, arguably one of our yeah. greater seasons with 2010 as well, where it was consistent it was between him and Harvick. And now he's back in that plateau, and I think Hamlin's learned those lessons of, like, how do I close out these races how do I, you know, he's learning the hard way with some of those things. I think, you know, Kansas is going to be back his mind if you go into Phoenix, trying to make the right line with those restart zones. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just again, you've got, you got Texas, which has been, if you saw last year's race, was a very much of a wild card with the tires. Yeah. Talladega, I think he controls himself a little bit better considering the fact that um, you know, you build your own luck in that situations. I know Hamlin, Bubba Wallace, those are a few of those yeah. drivers that usually contend up front. I think Ryan Blaney is another driver as well that are up front and are, you know, consistently making their own luck. And then obviously you made mention of the Robo. Again, a lot of things could happen, but I think it's going to be a lot tamer with the stage cautions. 
um, in the first part, and I think Ham was going to put himself in a position to not be in the chaos. So, you know, Hamlin has a legitimate good shot of making it to the championship four with some ease, I would say. But, you know, this is why we run these races. We can't put his <laughs> name in stone yet. We bout, you know, people I would make mention too, Martin Trex Jr., he made it into the playoffs, even though he was outside the playoffs. You know, most people were going to etch him in stone for this next round, but nothing is guaranteed in these playoffs. But the wind really is at Denny Hamlin's back right now. Uh, he, he's newly re-signed, which is racing to a multi-year deal. Both of his cars are advanced to the round of 12 for 2311 racing. Uh, so there's lots, lots of good things going on uh, for Den- Denny Hamlin right now. He has three wins on the year, which already exceeds his total for the past two years. He's 42 years old. Um, and you made mention of that one thing of the, uh, being re-signed with that. Yeah. That takes away resources and time, not considering the fact he was trying to sign a contract with Joe Gibbs Racing. He was trying to find a manufactured deal yeah. with 2311 Racing. So Hamlin has a lot less on his plate, and when he's more focused on that, boy, oh boy, we've already seen, he can be, uh, he can be a handful for the field. So yeah, after after he uh, won Saturday night, uh, Denny Hamlin was greeted by a good chunk of booze from the the fans at Bristol Motor Speedway and a cucumber and a cucumber <laughs> with um, a very specific wrapping on it. But it was plastic wrap, but what? yeah, okay, <laughs> it wasn't that. But yeah, somebody <laughs> uh, while Denny Hamlin was Dude. doing his TV interview, chucked a cucumber on the track. D- I, I, that is not part of my essential bringing to the track. No, He's just I, like sunscreen. I, was, I, I have like chargers stuff. Cucumber is, is not on that list. Yeah, I, I don't think Bristol Motor Speedway sells cucumbers. So if, I, if I had to take a guess, <laughs> we should probably do some investigative reporting. Does does Bristol Motor Speedway I, sell cucumbers? That are like I, I think, long? honestly, I would look more to the vendors. You could have some vendors just sell some cucumbers from odds and reasons. You just have some farmer's market out there. I don't know. But, but whoever threw this had had the full cucumber through the entire race. It's like, like I guess they, oh, I got this. <laughs> I don't, I, I guess I don't like Denny Hamlin. I guess I'll chunk it. Like, I mean, how, I wouldn't know how far up in the stands that person was. Uh, it didn't, I mean, it was probably not that far. Uh, I mean, it landed pretty close to the wall and rolled down. Uh, victory and I, I just want to know how he's like he got it in probably like through his clear backpack that nobody noticed that a cucumber was in there but but oh no, yeah our, our friend at front stretch adam cheek he he first tweeted out that picture on yes. the start finish line it's like who who threw this who threw the yeah the, you know that's not a part of your essential race weekend travel first time fans make note of that no all right here here, here are some uh we got some audio from denny hamlin from post race uh so, because because through this first round, it's basically been Denny Hamlin and Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson finished second uh, to to Hamlin on Saturday night, and Larson um, he through the first round uh, has led 174 laps in those three races, and uh, he he came away with uh, no no wait he won he won at Darlington he won, he won Darlington. at Darlington right yeah, he, he won he, at Can- uh, Kansas and obviously Hamlin yeah. there so to, those two drivers each scored a win. So, but yeah, they, so far, they're the guys to beat, it seems like. Um, but really, this first round of tracks has really just played into their their strengths. Um, that really changes going forward into this next round. They each have two win. They each, they each have a win at Texas. And since that track was repaved in 2017. Uh, but outside of those wins by each of them, they each only have... Uh, Hamlin has one other top five. Larson has two. Larson also has three DNFs for wrecks at that track. Um, and then you have the Roval. Kyle Larson has one at the Roval. Uh, Denny Hamlin isn't the best road course racer. Um, so that that's that's probably like the one track where... And Kyle Larson isn't good at super speedways. Yeah, he just seems like he gets caught up in yeah. everybody's mess. That, that's, the, that's his problem. He's in the eye of the storm. And I feel like that's, you know, Tal- Talladega magnifies that. Um, so Hamlin's got to capitalize at Talladega. Larson has to capitalize on the Roval for those two drivers to at least, um, like I said, to make it pretty comfortably in. But both have to perform well at Texas. And yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's hear what Hamlin had to say about Kyle Larson. Yeah, here's what here's what Denny Hamlin had to say about what what'll be like racing against him over the next three weeks. 
And Hamlin says he's going to do everything he can not to pay attention to Larson <laughs> because they have their own things going on. So here's what Denny Hamlin had to say after Saturday night's win. Well, I'm not looking to beat him over the next seven weeks. I'm just looking to try to get there, um, trying to get to Phoenix. You know, once we get there, then I'll focus on what it will take to be the best that day. It's not him. It's it's us, right? We know week in, week out, if we are at our best, we, we can't be beat. I, I just don't think so. Um, but you know, you just never know. You just never know. I, but the process, I don't want to keep skipping ahead of the next round and the next round. Um, I can't, there's no way I can focus on Phoenix right now because there's too many unknowns between now and then, but certainly, um, this year is different. And, you know, I told you guys before the playoff started, you know, this year just feels different, uh, with the capabilities of our team and, and the speed we're showing. So, you know, we've we've raced head to head the last three weeks, right? And he's it's been kind of one two, one two, one two. So uh, we we don't anything can happen, and and certainly he's not looking at me over the next six weeks, and I there's no way I can look at him. Um, we just have to figure out how we're going to get there with a shot. All right, Jared. Before before we uh, get into the drivers who advanced into the playoffs, second round of the playoffs, let's do a quick look at the top ten for Saturday night's race at Bristol. Absolutely. Well, as four mentioned, Denny Hamlin won this race, and Kyle Larson finished second after starting last. Pole sitter Christopher Bell finished in third. Chris Buescher finished in fourth. Ty Gibbs finished in fifth. Michael McDowell finished in sixth. Chase Elliott was seventh. Brad Keselowski was eighth. William Byron was ninth. And Ricky Stenhouse Jr. rounds out the top ten and the lead lap cars for this race. And... The, the the really the biggest surprise out of that top ten is Michael McDowell. Um, he, he had a great qualifying effort, and then he stayed in the top five for did he? He oh, got okay, stage he, points in, yeah. the second, in the second stage. Yeah, he, did. So he got stage points in the um, second stage and was able to come up with a sixth place finish. A run that they really needed, but the deficit was too yeah. big after the issues, especially that he had wrecked out at Darlington. Yeah, um, with uh, Mike McDowell, but. You know, it just wasn't enough points to make out, uh, you know, leapfrog those other drivers. Well, Denny Hamlin said on his podcast, Action Detrimental, that if there had been like a late caution, uh, he, he thought that probably McDowell might take two tires. And then if he restarts first, have good luck getting by him. Yeah. Um, he, he had, he had a, nothing to lose. Yeah. Everything to gain, nothing to lose for Mike McDowell with that late race caution. But no, that very, very, just very impressive run by McDowell. And um, we'll talk a little bit um, more about him in, here in a few minutes. Uh, Ty Gibbs uh, went out and threatened mid-race. Uh, he led what I believe is a, a career-high 102 laps mm -hmm. so far, and he finished fifth. But again, like the RFK racing guys, they're... They won here last year. I know, I know, but still, like... Uh, their consistency is coming back to their program. Yeah. They're starting to reap the awards. I've mentioned this for week in and week out. Every time we do our top 10 read, yeah. they're we're reaping the awards of building the system that Brad Keselowski has started. And again, they have two drivers yeah. in the top 10. <laughs> so again, props to them for, you know, capitalizing on a track that they're very well at. And, you know, both of those drivers advance to the next round of the playoffs. Yeah. Chris Buescher, last eight races, five top 10s, uh, and only one finish worse than 11th. Mm -hmm. And Keselowski, he has four straight top 10s and eight of the last 12. Yep. Um, so it just very, very remarkable what, what they've been able to, to put together. Uh, then you had Ricky Stenhouse Jr. in, in 10th. Uh, kind of kind of what I what I expected from him at Bristol. Bristol, the decent track for him. Yeah. He didn't have leading speed that we saw, but he, he was there. Um, That's why I made the prediction of him trying to make it to the round at 12. Um, you know, his finishes, Kansas wasn't really good at 23rd, but he finished 16th at Darlington and a 10th at Bristol. Those are not like I said, finishes to scoff at, especially for yeah. a single car team. The and problem at, is and, and at Darlington at one point he was like two laps down. Yeah. And he came back. So it's again, those stage points are going to really help him when you're in the, like I said, the bottom down bottom uh, at the bottom half of the playoff hunt. And, you know, he didn't have enough chaos where he could just waltz his way into it just yet. But real, okay. Jared, the most impressive uh, run of the night, clearly, at least for me, was Carson Osovar. 
Yeah. Uh, again. <laughs> we forgot about the fourth. Well, we forgot about the other two drivers that were eliminated. Uh, both former champions of the sport. Uh, one of my predictions, Joey Logano, wrecked out, um, was right at that cut line. Just like I said, he just didn't have that speed, you know, that no. under the radar speed. Um, even though he's 12th and 5th in the first two rounds, again, just not not enough points to advance. And uh, Kevin Harvick, man, he just fell off a cliff. Oh, yeah. Uh, Harvick, in his last start at Bristol Motor Speedway, uh, five laps down. Uh, he had a horribly handing, handling car. Uh, we saw him multiple times like get into the wall, coming out of the turn. Uh, it was just not a good night for that car. So, yeah, unfortunately... Uh, Kevin Harvick is not advancing uh, into the round of two, the the second round, the round of twelve, the yeah, round of twelve. So he will not have a shot at the championship in his final. And uh, just season. imagine with the effects that happened, Harvick was leading late at the Spring Phoenix race. Mm-hmm. That caution came out for Harrison Burton. He yep. lost the lead. If yep. that caution didn't come out, he would have had enough points to advance into that next round. And it's just. It's just a sad ending he, for... He, he was the leader before the caution at Daytona yeah. sent it to overtime. Yeah. He, he was that close. He was that close. It's just it's just a sad way for... That's how kind of Harvick's career just dwindled. It's just a, a really bad handling car where he finishes five laps down in 29th position. All right. And uh, our, our friends from Front Stretch, uh, we have video from them of his crew chief, Rodney Childers, Talking about their their effort uh, Saturday night, uh, Childers kind of just kind of in disbelief because he considers this his his best track, uh, but he called Saturday night's race their worst race of the season. Uh, here's what Rodney Childers had to say: uh, It needed everything. It needed everything. I don't know. We've always been really really good here, and um, I don't know. Like for some reason, it it just seems like something's messed up, or you know, I, my guys are freaking awesome and we don't ever have things messed up but just you know that's how it ran is if something is screwed up somewhere but um i don't know i mean it just it just wouldn't do anything right i mean um we tried and tried to try and to get it to do something we were just talking about it with the 12 guys and theirs were doing the same thing so i don't know if we're missing it with something from a manufacturer standpoint or what but um they wouldn't. They wouldn't do anything right. How uh, how disappointing is this? Given us, you know, your last shot with Kevin. Uh, I mean, Bristol's my favorite place. I've never ran bad here my whole life. It didn't matter if it was in a late model, an all pro car, if it was in a coming here with Hooters Pro Cup cars and Bush cars and and Cup cars. Like this has always been my place. So to finish five laps down is a joke. Uh, we got to go back to the shop and figure out what's wrong. You guys have the opportunity now just to go for the win that's all that's all you can really, you know, really have to care about um how much is that a good thing with these final races okay. yeah i mean you know we we've definitely had ups and downs you know i thought we had a car good enough to win in darlington and we got kind of screwed into a, a situation that didn't work out and um and then these last two races we've unloaded off the truck way too tight at both of them and haven't been good enough so um you know it was fortunate that we were fast at Darlington but you know to come here and run like this this is the most disappointing race of the year so we gotta we gotta go back and figure that out so and on the, on the flip side of Kevin Harvick uh you have Martin Truex Jr. and Bubba Wallace uh advancing into the round of 12 Martin Truex Jr. who was the regular season champion uh he he gets gets by uh by this the snake the the Barely, he gets it in barely. Uh, he he finished with five point five points above the cut line, and then you had Bubba Wallace, who still has no stage points, or playoff points. I'm sorry, playoff points. Uh, going into the round of twelve, uh, he's only the third driver to advance into the second round, despite not having any playoff points in uh, the stage era. Um, and so that puts both twenty three eleven cars into the round of twelve. Uh, here's what Bubba Wallace uh, had to say after the race uh, about a, a, another, yet another emotionally draining race for the 2311 racing driver. Trying to gather my thoughts and, man, just emotional. Um, I, I said to myself out loud, not on radio, proud of you, kid. And we all know that. I rarely do that. So um, 
Just uh, just way to stick with it. Try to give away a couple times. Got frustrated at myself, frustrated at others. But it all worked out. So um, just what you need to do is execute. So this is a special day. And got to cherish it, but can't get complacent. We know Texas is up and we're okay there, but we got to come out swinging and uh, and come out on the right end of it. So, ready to go to work. You overcame a 19 point deficit to advance on points. How significant is that part of it? And what does that do for the team morale heading forward? I think the strategy at the beginning was, uh, was the game changer, staying out there. We watched last year's race and seen that tires were not that big of an advantage. So, Thought that was uh, thought that was key, and that gave us our buffer. Why does this mean so much? Why does it mean so much? I beat myself up so many times over the years, and I sound like some of the people up in the stands. And uh, just to see us continue to march forward is, is important for my mental, the team's mentals, everybody involved in this program. So just got to keep it going. Because you came over the radio afterward and said, we're not supposed to be in it. According to others, we're not supposed to be. Right, right. So are you I mean, you, 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 can't, you can't chase that stuff too much. I think that's where I got caught up years past is trying to prove the doubters wrong and not racing for self and racing for the team. And when you race for the team, race for yourself, all that stuff falls in line. So it's cool. Coming from relief or just joy or where, where's the emotion coming from? All of the above. I'm just slapped more out. I thought Daytona was stressful, but that was stressful. All right. So uh, of for you, Jared, of, of these guys who the 12 drivers who are advancing into the round of 12, uh, who's most impressive for you? Who, who's oh, wow. I, he, he made it besides Bubba Wallace. I, guess. I, I, I was going to say, well, like I said, Bubba Wallace, he st- the reason why I want to point him out. He started the night minus 19 points below the cut line. And because Logano and Harvick had their issues, Logano wrecked out and Harvick was really slow. He was able to squeak his way in there. He had stage points. Um, as you, like I said, he did score stage points at um, stage once. So he was able to bank some points. Mm-hmm. I feel like he learned some lessons, I believe, at Watkins Glen. You know, not taking the best, you know, sometimes you don't have the best car, but it's just managing those finishes and managing those stage points. Because there was that back against the wall at the Indianapolis road course. We had Mm -hmm. his points cut in half. And then all of a sudden, you know, he backed it up, was able to get a, you know, decent enough lead at Watkins Glen for points that at Daytona, he didn't have to worry too much. And I mean, you made mention of Martin Truex Jr. You know, that would have been bonkers if he missed, (laughs) if he missed that uh, round of 12, if he was the regular season champion. So, and, if you think about it, he benefit he benefited from a caution that he sort of maybe kind of didn't uh, create, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was really uh, he, he on lap three hundred sixty three coming coming out of I believe it was turn four mm-hmm. uh, he just got loose and kind of like slapped the wall a little bit like he got I me mean, he, he got really sideways yeah um, but NASCAR like immediately threw the caution at first they said it was for debris. But then they revised it to say, oh, number 19 was in an accident. And afterwards, Hendrix Jr. was kind of like in disbelief. I can't believe they threw a caution for that. Yeah, and 19th place finish, just not, again, not an amazing finish, but just by the skin of his teeth, he made it through. But yeah, thanks to a 130-lap run after the pit stops from that caution, they were able to, you know, make some adjustments. And yeah, then he drove his way up to, to 19th. And he's on to the round of 12, and he's now... Tied with William Byron when it comes to seeding. So he went from almost out to back at the top of the mountain. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah. T- Tyler, uh, Bubba Wallace and Martin Truex Jr., they had uh, very interesting nights. Uh, in this in sport, this nothing comes easy. <laughs> nothing comes easy. But, yeah. Okay, going, going back to the point I was going to make earlier, though. Really one of the most impressive runs of the night was Carson Hosovar mm-hmm. in the number 42 car for uh, Legacy Motor Club. At one point, he was in the top five. Um, he had a car that could potentially win uh, w- at one point over his radio. I think it was 
during pit stops. He told him, like, give me out front and I'll, I'll run, run away. That's a lot of confidence for a, like a 20 year old guy making his fourth <laughs> NASCAR Cup Series start. Um, I think it's helped him that he's had the confidence built on the truck series, right? Mm-hmm. He didn't have this 2023 season to be a little bit different, but I think going from trucks to cup is the right move for Carson Hosvar. I don't think he needs to be staying in the Xfinity series. He needs to be jumping up in that cup series. Those The trucks and the cups are very are more similar than the cups in the Xfinity series. seems like yeah, we've seen that regression when you jump up in the Xfinity series, have the success, I mean, there's countless drivers, Chase Briscoe, Austin Sendrick, Harrison Burton, uh, A.J. Amendinger. They're more or less the back markers of the Cup Series because they've had this experience with the Xfinity Series. And all of a sudden, you just see Carson Hosovar just snap up here, have this six crazy success because he, you know, he hasn't had that, that much experience in the Xfinity Series car. Drives much different. So he's making the right moves. And again, like I said, 11 place finish, running up top five. Um, a lot of potential, a lot of eyeballs are going to be looking at Carson Hosovar. So I think it needs to be asked though, because Legacy Motor Club as a whole has had a rebound mm-hmm. over the last month and a half or so. Um, but you know, Hosovar is in this car because no Graxon is no longer in it. Yes. Um, and he did poorly in that car up until basically the switch happened. Um, and though Josh, Josh Berry ran just one race. Yeah. He ran at Michigan. Yeah. And then yeah. Rockefeller ran at the end of the right. course. That's right. Hawkins Glen, I believe. So how much do you put into the, the, the change in the fortunes of the 42 car being the team as a whole is doing better or how much do you put into the driver is better than what it came before? I, I put a stock mainly in the driver as mentioned with the Xfinity Series, uh, Gregson was an Xfinity Series regular and contended for the championship. But I, I, I think the team took a step back here this last year. And Gregson, for being a new, you know, that's his, his rookie season. It's tough when a team kind of takes a step back from where they were last year compared to this year. So it's a little bit of both. But I think it's refreshing for Legacy Motor Club to have Carson Hosovar and this kind of just reset uh, for the 42 team for this year before John Hunter Nemechek comes and takes over the uh, ride. Yeah, we, we, we failed to mention that on, on last week's episode. We should have that, yes, John Hunter Nemechek was announced as being the full-time driver for the number 42 uh, next year after going back down to the b- both the truck series for a few years uh, to race for Cobblers Motorsports and then uh, going with JGR. This is just, this is one year. This first year with JGR, yeah, right? Like yeah, like I said, this first is year. first year. So after having three years away, after a pretty uneventful year with uh, Front Row Motorsports in 2020, uh, he took a gamble on himself, and now he's going to be rewarded with yet another cup ride. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if the, what Carson Osovar is doing for the number 42 team right now will be able to translate uh, next year. All right, so that should do it uh, for, for the Bristol night race. Um, so now we will go into our news roundup for this week. Okay. All right. So news roundup time. So the, the biggest news of the last week by far, uh, was the news that live fast motorsports, uh, the team that's co-owned by BJ McLeod and former, uh, driver Matt Tift is selling its charter to Spire Motorsports for around forty million dollars, um, which is a lot of money, <laughs> uh, and which is the the like the last ma- the last major tr- uh, charter transaction that that I can remember was when Twenty Three Eleven Racing bought its second charter a couple a couple years ago. That was thirteen million. Uh, we are now up to forty. Um, I know you, you uh, earlier, Jared. You had brought up the the lifespan of this charter. <laughs> so, for, do you want to detail the history of this charter yeah, for everyone? This, charter, this convoluted, very convoluted system. Yeah, this is not as simple as BJ McLeod um, and Matt Tiff making out forty million dollars. There's other ownership uh, stakes involved. This was originally a circle sport, uh, team back in the day. Joe Falk owned that team. So he has a stake of 
ownership in that number 78 team. Um, that team kind of bounced around, was with Levine, then went back to go fast racing for a couple years. And then after the 2020 season, go fast basically made it to the live fast charter. So there's a lot of, uh, there's quite a few people more involved in the ownership of the live fast charter than it seems on paper. Um, but it's still a pretty big payday for BJ McLeod and Matt Tiff and those ownerships cashing out when they can, because remember when it was just four or five, six years ago when charters were going just a couple million dollars, Yeah, those were the cheap old days. And now there's just <laughs> like their 10 X and they're cashing in, uh, with their plans. They're, I believe they're going part-time. They're not leaving the sport for the Cup Series just yet. Um, they're just cashing out more or less in their investment uh, to track house racing. Um, that's the other part of the deal. So that way, um, track house has another charter for next season. Mm -hmm. But it's just the charter systems that have built this inflated uh, system where mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's just name your price to be the exclusive club of these 36 charter teams in order to, you know, get paid, like I said, most of the system, uh, most of the winnings are through these uh, charter teams. They're not really through these open teams. So if they want to make it in the sport, you either have to, like I said, pay up or buddy up or you have to get out of the way. But th there really hasn't been any open teams this year, for the most part, outside of, uh, like, you know, 2311 running a third car, track house running a third car. Third yeah. Cars, yeah. And I think I looked. There, there, there's no Gaunt Brothers racing. Uh, there's, what, what was that European based team last year? It started with an H. Her, her, I don't. Oh, you're at Hasenberg or something? Yeah. Like the 27 Shockville News team. Yeah. Yeah. The, there hasn't been the, the, the money team this year. Um, they were at Daytona. But still. Yeah. They, but haven't, then, they haven't been in a while. Um, but yeah, I think I only I looked at like um, there's only been like 62 drivers who have tempted this season. And uh, where's the owner standings? Yeah, there's only 44 entries mm -hmm. in the owner points. And as you mentioned, the 36 of the other teams, Track House Racing had an open, Front Row Motorsports, yeah. Colleg mm -hmm. Racing, 2311, mm -hmm. Richard Childress Racing, Legacy yeah. Motor Club. The only uh, other two teams mm -hmm. is, as you mentioned, the Money Racing Team and Beard Motorsports. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. it for teams that are in the Cup Series. So... It's ch changing times right now because live fast motorsports really was like the back marker team in the field right now. Well, they didn't have the resources yeah. to compete. And I mean, you know, you, the you, Starcom racing did the same thing. They just said, you know what? It's better to take this investment of $27 million and just let it go. than comparative try to race week in and week out. And the tough thing about this, we're not really seeing new teams pop up into the cup series. Nope. Um, you know, that's a really tight field. As we mentioned, that's just it. So that's what, there's only been 14 teams compete in the cup series this year. Um, it's taking more of a formula one esque, uh, type of drive, oh. but, um, but yeah, that's, that's the tough thing about it. If you need the growth on the outside, it's just, it's not happening. And that's what, that's what NASCAR was built on. Remember the, uh, there was the days back in the seventies and eighties when the Daytona 500, there was like 60, 70 cars entering mm. the 500, trying to get into speed, um, like I said, a few weeks. Even more recently in the modern era, that happened where you'd have, you know, 10, 15 cars go home. Now it's just a rarity. You know, Daytona, you might have a couple cars go home and that's it. I think the last time that somebody went home, not at um, Daytona, I believe was 2018 at Texas. That's how long ago there was a D&Q. Mm. That wasn't uh, at the Daytona Speed Weeks. Wow, it's been that long since you know more teams have showed up than what's been going on. But so now with with, with Lift Fast going away after this year, that the back half of the field really is now Spire Motorsports, and who's got connections now, obviously with Trackhouse Racing. They have connections with Hendrick. Uh, you have Rick Ware Racing. We forgot to mention the second part of what's where's yeah. this charter going to? We'll, we'll get. We'll, We'll get, yeah. to, we'll get we'll get we'll, to, we'll get there but yeah that's what i want to make we'll, mention we'll, of we'll that get, yeah but you have rick ware racing who's right now they're in alliance uh with rfk racing i could imagine rfk buying that out at some point to actually get those charters for themselves but that might be a while well there there is the battle for the ownerships remember the bottom three charters if you're in the bottom three charters 
for three consecutive years. Yeah. NASCAR could revoke the charter. They haven't done that yet. They haven't done that yet, uh, but there is wa- on watch for, I believe, the 51 team. Um, they are in the bottom three right now. In the last two years, that charter was in the bottom three. So there could be a possibility with that charter being revoked, but since the charter system has been enacted since uh, 2016, there's not been a charter that has been revoked in this era. But I mean, one of the reasons why the the cost of these charters is going up is because the the charters that could potentially be up for purchase are almost gone right now. Mm-hmm. Like I like I said, I think Brickware Racing is like the only team I could potentially see where they finally maybe just give up theirs. Um, I mean, Spire's got three now. Yeah. Um. So, but what what the only way we get more charters? into the, the bloodstream of this whole system is if NASCAR introduces some new charters. And the mm-hmm. only way that happens is if a new manufacturer comes in. Like Steve Phelps has said that. For that for there to be more charters, there has to be a new manufacturer. Yeah. And for years now, NASCAR's been trying to lure a new manufacturer by keeping horsepower down, bringing in the next gen car to lower costs. Um, and then... No one's on the horizon. We keep hearing rumors. Oh, they're having conversations with new manufacturers, and yet, still nothing. Um, so, and I would like to see a new manufacturer in the sport. I think a lot of people would. Um, I think it's the problem is is like they said the exclusivity. Remember when the last time we had a manufacturer in the sport, they had to get in was Toyota. Yeah, and you know it's they, been over fifteen years now. It's been over fifteen years. And one of the big issues is once you add those charters, now you're decreasing the value of the charter because there's more people in there. So, I, I mean, you're going to expect backlash either way with the charter system, whether you get rid of it or at, try to add more teams to make sure there's more people. You know, that's, like I said, that's not going to, you know, it's not going to be easy. Um, like I said, with the with uh, Live Fast Racing going away, what you're going to have, like I said, about 10, 15 teams just left in the Cup Series. All right, so w- moving on from the charter cell, time to go, yeah, talk about the other part of this, stepping into c- silly season stuff. Um, so as part of the Live Fast uh, Motorsports uh, deal with Spire, uh, Trackhouse Racing has signed uh, defending Truck Series champion Zane Smith uh, to a deal, and they're going to farm him out <laughs> to Spire Motorsports to drive this third car for that team. Um, so... Zane Smith, he's a former... He drove for Junior Motorsports in the Xfinity Series for one year, um, but he's, he's been in the Truck Series for two... It's been a couple years co- now. A couple years now. Motorsports. At one point, and this astounds me, uh, I believe it was at the end of 2021 season, uh, he, he told some reporters, and I was there at Phoenix, uh, that he had... Before Chip Ganassi had decided to like sell all of his NASCAR, asset, NASCAR assets to... Uh, track Justin Marks track house. He had signed <laughs> Zane Smith to to a deal to drive in the Cup Series um, before he had ever won a thing in NASCAR, um, which I never ever understood. Um, but now Zane Smith is a Truck Series champion, has handful of wins, uh, and he, he's going to go uh, Cup racing uh, next week, next year. Uh, technically for Track House, but driving for. Spire, Spire, Spire yeah. Motorsports. Um, the little complicated deal to come up with $40 million in this case to bring in a prospect in the Cup Series. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of potential. And as we mentioned with Carson Hostfar, curious to see how that goes, considering mm. that the fact that Truck Series are pretty similar to the Cup Series. So um, curious in case on how this will go for next season, but I think this is a long-term goal for Zane Smith. Good for him. I think the biggest loser is Ford. <laughs> Had him in front row motorsports. Couldn't really work out a deal to get him in front row motorsports or uh, in the rumored 10 car. So, you know, like mm-hmm. I said, but Zane Smith made the best of his opportunity. So who's going in the 10 car now? <laughs> Does Eric Almorola really retire? He needs to let people know at some point if he is or not. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven races left in yeah. the season. So... Soon, hopefully. Uh, all right, so the other silly season, season news is Daniel Hamrick, uh, a former Rookie of the Year in the Cup Series, is coming back to the Cup Series um, after a few years down the, in the Xfinity Series where he won 
uh, the 2021 Xfinity Series Championship with his so far only NASCAR National Series win. He won the race at Phoenix at the end of 2021, which won him the championship. It's the only thing he has <laughs> ever won uh, it, in NASCAR, which is just incredible. Um, so, yeah, he'll, he'll be getting into the number 31 car, taking over for Justin Ailey, who is now moving over to Rick Ware Racing uh, next year. Um, Daniel Hammer kind of almost kind of backed this up the, the, the <laughs> Friday night uh, by almost going out and winning uh, the Xfinity race at Bristol. Uh, he, he stayed out after a late pit stop and uh, unfortunately couldn't hold off Justin Algar long enough to get the win. He's been sneaky good. And I think if looking at the biggest disappointments this year, um, I, I think tops would obviously be legacy motor club, but I, I would make an argument that the cup series program for college has been really off this year. Yeah. Amendinger has been nowhere to f- been found. Haley's been okay, but Hemrick's been sneaky good. He's had quite a few, you know, quite a few good finishes this season. Um, in the Xfinity series again, no finishes of, uh, second, but he's had already six top fives and 14 top tens this season. You know, he, he, he's a solid top five finisher. Yeah. Like he has a, a lot of top five finishes in, in his entire, uh, NASCAR career, but it's just, he can't but seal I the think, deal. But I think the important <laughs> thing for colleagues racing's development right now is they need consistency with their cup series program. Just seems like they're yeah. all over the board and they're, you know, they're running the back half of the field. I think this gives them a little bit more stability on their program. Um, I don't expect Daniel Hammer to go out and win multiple races yeah. next season, but I think this will be a big step forward for colleagues racing cup series program. All right. So our, our last uh, news item. So the 2024 NASCAR sc- schedule hasn't been released yet. It could be this week. It could be next week, but pieces could be in p- December. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Um, but some some pieces of it are coming into uh uh into coming into frame. Uh, in the last week, it was announced that the, the Clash, the ex, the preseason exhibition race, is returning to the LA Col- Coliseum for a third straight year, um, which is I think is exciting. Uh, this time there will be a companion race with the NASCAR Mexico Series, um, which I think is also a very good idea given you know the, the Hispanic population in in Southern California. And right there on the border of Mexico. Um, I think that's a great idea. What do you think about that? Bring in the new series. And I like that where there needs to be more companion races of NASCAR reaching out with these different series. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that Montreal, that happens with the Pinty series. Mm-hmm. If they go to uh, Circuit Gilles Veneux, uh in there. But I think this is a good... Uh, like I said, considering the clash, the location, I think that's a good call for the Mexico series. It's just how does this, uh, like I said, how is this treated with like television and how is this going to be affecting with the audience type of stuff? Are these people going to show up to the Mexico series and uh, become fans? But I think this is a good to at least expose them to the Mexico series. Uh, another scheduling item, Road America, uh, despite not being on the schedule for the Cup Series this year, it was on the Xfinity Series schedule as it has been since about 2010. That won't be the case uh, next year, partially due to the Olympics uh, and NBC having to switch some stuff around for that, for that, which will be like a two week break uh, for the sport. So Road America will not be on the NASCAR Xfinity, Xfinity series schedule uh, next year, which I, I hate that for Wisconsin fans. You, yeah. you, you get the cup race for two years, then that gets taken away for the Chicago street court street course race, but you keep that Xfinity race, but then that's at least temporarily uh, gone, which is unfortunate. Um, and they might not even be getting a truck series return to the Milwaukee mile. And I thought those success, those events were really well. Um, like I said, especially the Milwaukee mile, that's still, I'm um, not, but I mean, I was at least thankful that I was able to be at that Xfinity series race at road America. And yeah. like I said, that was definitely a, th- how could you, like I said, that finish, Going back and forth between Mayer and Parker Kligerman oh, yeah. and all. I yeah. mean, that that was a classic right there, but it's sad to see it not be on the schedule this season. Yeah. So our last uh, scheduling note, Bristol related. Uh, say, say so long, farewell to Bristol Dirt. You are no more. After three years, uh, the dirt's going to stay in storage. Uh, next spring's, whenever it is, uh, NASCAR race weekend at the half-mile track will be, be on pavement. Good. 
I, the thing is, the dirt race is just more. I don't want to say. I a liked gimm- it. I I thought it was fun. It, it was it was a gimmick to mask up the issues of what's going on with this. I mean, with the uh, racing, especially with the next gen car. I felt like obviously it happened before the next gen, yeah. but I think you know. Dirt, I think it would be good just for the truck series or Xfinity series, have them for a purpose for them to go to truck race. If you want to see some dirt racing, go to the truck series down there. But, you know, I think we need to, one of the big things for this next gen car needs to be looked at is our road course racing and the short track racing. This gives another opportunity for NASCAR to have another race for them to see what's going on with this next gen car and how to perform and better perform at these racetracks for them. But yeah, it's going to be back on the pavement in spring. But fans, show up for it. You you yeah. apparently wanted it. You were clamoring for it. You're getting it back. Uh, before before it before we went to dirt, you guys weren't showing up for the spring race. They infamously didn't even sell seats for the the ends of the of the track. It was just on the straightaways. It was embarrassing. And then we brought in dirt. More people showed up. More people tuned in for the race. Ratings were better. So, okay, now we're going back to pavement. Show up. Watch. I'm curious to see how that was with the, you know, with that rating bump with Easter. I think that... I mean, that was part of it, but still more people were watching. Yeah, and I think that's that might be part of it. You know, where might be a better place to put Bristol on the schedule is to be determined. But, yeah, I mean, show up. That That's the big thing. Make sure butts are in seats. That's my rule number one of... You know, having a good race, having people in seats. Simple as that. And r- ratings do matter. And only 1.5 million people watched the Bristol race Saturday night. I know I know the college football season is in full swing. It was on USA Network. It was on... U- <sighs> only, only, I think, next week. This weekend's on USA. I think after that, it's all NBC. Yeah, like I said, that is that is correct. This is the last race on USA Network. Now you can go to big... You can turn on to NBC affiliates and it'll be on. I, I, don't, I don't know who's the person who's making the programming calls when it comes to these races. Roger but, Penske. But it's ridiculous. The, the, the start of the playoff should be on NBC. The Bristol Night Race should be on NBC. It's, yeah. Anyway, um, that's, a, that's a rant for another time. All right, enough of news. We had a lot of news. Um, so moving on to our preview for the first race of the second round of the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs at Texas Motor Speedway. <clears throat> All right, it's time for probably the most difficult round of the NASCAR Cup Series Playoffs, that's the round of 12. And we started off at with the Auto Trader, Echo Park, Automotive 400 at Texas Motor Speedway. Uh, infamously, one of widely one of the least popular tracks on the schedule for the last five years or so. Um, but thankfully, it's no longer 500 miles. It is now 400 miles uh, and 267 laps around the 1.5 uh, mile track in North Fort Worth, uh, Texas, which you can see on at 2.30 p.m. on USA. Jared, like I said, this is the most interesting, maybe the most dangerous, one of the hardest rounds to get through. You have uh, Texas, which is a unique... A lot of tire problems last year. Yeah, but we we had other tracks with tire problems last year that we haven't had the same problems this year, like Bristol. We didn't have any problems. Noticeable. Uh, anyway. Kansas, I know with that, but I think that was the infamous uh, race right there. That was the... One was a puncture, the other two were actual failures, yeah. so it wasn't like a rash. But it still, it, it caused a lot of chaos on that yeah. race. And uh, as you mentioned here, this is this is the opener of the round of 12, and Tyler Reddick won here last year. Yes, yes, he did, his, in one of his final uh, wins with Richard Childress Racing. Uh, the, t- the top five for this race last year was interesting. He had Reddick, then Joey Logano second. I, ha- I had no, I completely forgot that Justin Haley was third in this race last year. How did that happen? Again, a lot of that attrition. Yeah. And then you had Ryan Blaney and Chase Briscoe and Ryan Blaney is someone who probably would really, really, really like to finish fourth. Everybody, <laughs> I think, well, <laughs> probably besides Tyler Reddick, every, well, Tyler would like to win, but I think everybody would be happy with that. Same, that was in the top five last year. Would be happy with the same result. 
Oh, yeah, but yeah, this like I said, this is gonna be a complicated round. You have Texmo Speedo, which is a unique uh, 1.5 mile track by ill design. Um, you have the turns one and two, which have been flattened uh, compared to the, the high banks of turns three and four, um, which has turned this track into a, a nightmare for drivers and for people watching. Um, and then you have Talega, which is just you know anything could happen. You could get caught up in a 20 car wreck. 20 car wreck and the blink of an eye and your day is ruined and your playoffs ruined. And then you have the Roval, which is the only track that we go to that combines a 1.5 mile oval and a road course on the inside of the track. Um, so it's, it's anything can happen this round. Um, it's not the first round, which feels like kind of like a walk in a park, walk in the park by comparison. Yeah. Who, who you got for your first round picks? Uh, who's going to win this, uh, opener at texas motor speedway daniel oh boy i actually haven't thought about it much um uh gosh i'm gonna go with uh, well i'm going with safe money with kyle larson <laughs> safe money. <laughs> okay. young money safe money kyle larson one here in 2021 um yeah like i said i think he's gonna kick off the uh, round 12 like he did at um, Darlington with a win. All right. I'm going to go with a back-to-back -back winner. I'm going to go with Reddick uh, to do it. Um, Completely different circumstances with 2311 Racing. Yeah. Um, but he, like I said, looking ahead into this playoff cutoff, we made our predictions. Half of them were right. <laughs> half of mine were right, half of them were wrong. And I think you only got like one or two. No, I said... I had Logano out. You had Logano. Um, I had Logano out too. And Mc, I think I had McDowell out. Yeah, we had McDowell. I had Stenhouse in, which was not. And I had Bubble Wallace I had out. I had Chastain out. Yeah, um, I did too. So, all right. So yeah, here, here's the twelve going into this week. You have William Byron and Martin Truex Jr. They're, they're tied atop the, the top of the standings. They each have three thousand thirty six points. And then after that, you have Hamlin, Larson, Chris Buescher, Kyle Busch, Christopher Bell, Tyler Reddick. And the first four out right now are Ross Chastain and Brad Keselowski. They each have 3,011 points. And then you have Ryan Blaney and the Bubba Wallace, who, again, only has 3,000 points, no playoff points to, to lean on. Um, so my, my first four, my four out for the round of 12, I'm going Ryan Blaney, um, Kyle Busch, Christopher Bell, and Ross Chastain. You think Bubba Wallace is going to make the round of eight? Talladega, man. He's good at Talladega. Yeah, I know he's good at Talladega, but he's he's got points to make up. I have him out. I have um, I have Ross Chastain out. I have Seabell out. And I have Martin Truex Jr. He only has 25 points. Mm. He's not been performing well. I think this is going to be the round that axes him out. I, re I, re I did originally have Wallace out. Um, because I, in my mind, I'm going to again pick Kozlowski to win at yeah. Talladega. Well, at Talladega, so. I think again it's that that is his time to shine. But the question is, now going into the round of eight, this is when you need to step up, especially yeah. in this type of situation. Mm -hmm. He made it by the skin of his teeth. Yeah. And Bubba Wallace, these last few races hasn't been performing. He wasn't really up there at Kansas, which was what he won won there last year. Yeah. I know when he won at Talladega a couple years ago. But, you know, the question is now, you've got to step up, especially if you're outside the playoff cut line. And he, he needs to make up 14 points already. Mm -hmm. I know he made up 23, but that was through attrition of its own, which can happen. But again, you've got to create your own luck in this situation. And mm -hmm. that's why I've, kind of, like I said, with those, that's why I picked those drivers. Ironically, I picked three Toyotas to miss the oh, wow. next round. But yeah, for me, like Kyle Busch being out, that's, that feels kind of easy because he hasn't really done. I've much argued that since I feel like Gateway. I feel like Kyle Busch is having a Joey Logano season, just very under the radar, which he had this type of season. I think this could be somewhere where Kyle Busch can just squeak in, make it to the round of eight, start making some noise, and before you know it, he's celebrating his championship in Phoenix. All right, but yeah, so that that's our predictions for both the race and the round of twelve. Um, it should be an interesting round, chaotic round. Um, so we'll, we'll see you on the other side. So anyway, that'll, that'll do it 
uh, for us this week. Uh, I'm Dan McFadden. You can reach me on Twitter at Dan McFadden, or you can email me at dmcfadden at adgnewsroom.com. Jared, where can they reach you? And they can find me on the app formerly known as Twitter at Real Jared Haas. All right, that will do it for us. Thank you again for watching Dropping the Hammer with Dan McFadden, presented by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. We'll be back here next week to recap whatever happens at Texas this Sunday, and we will then preview Talladega Super Speedway. Have a great weekend, everyone.